In 2019, the Afiba Center was served an eviction notice after a year of questioning 8th District's council member Marquise Harris Dawson's plan to use the Afiba Center's parking lot to construct a pocket park and build a 120 foot towering sign as a landmark to the Crenshaw area. To worsen matters, while LA was in the midst of the COVID-19 global health crisis and a serious homelessness crisis, the Afiba Center staff were locked out of the property in 2020 in spite of a judge's ruling for the city to not take that type of action. What was the issue? A proposal presented to Afiba Center as part of Destination Crenshaw, an initiative submitted to and approved by City Council as a community-inspired public art and streetscape project along the coming LAX Crenshaw Metro line. While Destination Crenshaw put forth that the project would address historic disinvestment, environmental equity, and preserve the cultural character of the Crenshaw community, the Afiba Center expressed to Councilman Harris Dawson that they were concerned if his plans would cause more harm than good. Moreover, Jabari Jumane, founder of the FIBA Center, and others in the community took the position that they thought Destination Crenshaw would operate more as a Trojan horse that would rapidly usher in gentrification in an area that still has one of the highest concentrations of Black-owned single-family housing. Well, their resistance was met with being kicked out. Nonetheless, ardent supporters of the Afiba Center have been bringing to light their battle, as well as other redevelopment projects jeopardizing the presence of Black constituents in mom-and-pop stores. We talked to Inspector Jumane, a veteran LA City firefighter, and Mr. Lynn Moses, an activist who has been monitoring the activities and fiscal responsibility of local officials. This is part two of Saving the Afiba Center. Let's embark on the Ark Republic to hear current news that's published. More than gossip and chatter, covering current affairs that matter. We talk issues with professional views, all keeping you in queue. We wanted a higher vibe for these days and times. The free the voices and minds, reporting the sign of the times, so all can build. Let's shine, yeah. Two years later. Now, as you stated, that you are locked out, they have chained the doors, Correct. you have no access in. What happened from 2019 to now for it to get or escalate to where it is? What, what happened was we, uh, we were served paperwork. We had to go to an unlawful detainer hearing. Um, at that unlawful detainer hearing in about December of 2019, uh, the city was given, um, what, did, what did they call it? Right of possession of the building. And subsequent to that, the next year in June of 2020, the city went back uh, in an ex parte effort to get a lockout order from the courts to lock us out. That lockout order was denied by the courts. Um, mm. And that is the last piece of legal paperwork we had and against the lockout order, the city locked us out. It was not the sheriffs. They have said time and time again, the sheriffs did it. No, the sheriffs did not do it. Um, we had community individuals who were there taking pictures of the city uh, employees who under the direction of Marquise Harris Dawson locked us out of the building. So let me, um, in speaking to um, a representative Antoine Roberts in 2019, about this, uh, about Councilman Marquise Dawson's uh, position um, um, about why they feel the AFIBA Center um, should lead. There were several reasons, and I would like for you to respond to those reasons. One of the reasons stated was that there were not enough community events that happened at the AFIBA Center. Can you respond to that? Certainly. During the unlawful detainer, uh, hearings, the city asked for our last three calendar year, our last three hard copy calendars. And they followed that with a question saying, how many events on average per month you all put on at the Afiba Center for the last three years? We were able to demonstrate 
scanning them copies of all three years of calendars. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that we uh, put on 22 events per month, every month for the last three years. And one month even did 48. So there were numerous uh, that month done on given days. So that, that allegation doesn't hold water. When you're putting on 22 events per month, you're almost putting on an event per day. So we heard nothing else about that allegation. Second, um, second issue that was raised was, is that um, city employees did not have access to the building. Yes, we heard something similar. It was a little, a little bit more demonstrative than that, the way we heard it, but it's probably meaning the same thing. We heard that city officials were denied access to the building. Um, we were able to, and are still to this day, able to disprove that. And in fact, during the unlawful detainer hearing, the real estate services office, who they were referring to as individuals who were denied access, the supervisor of the real estate services office in writing said they gained access to the building. They were allowed access to the building. So that doesn't hold water. That was just another lie. If you're, there if you're putting on 22, uh, sometimes 40 events per month, all you have to, the fee percentage within, they don't charge anybody for anything. All you have to do is walk in the door. So why, could, why didn't they just walk in the door? Apparently they did. Just nonsense. Yes. Next. There, there were also some allegations. This is not um, from the representative that I spoke with, but in me reading that there were allegations that you did not have the proper or the sufficient insurance. Yeah, uh, another lie. Um, that was said in an article that I can recall in September um, of 2019. We invited the LA Times in and the LA Times took a picture of our actual policy. We can't make up the state numbers on this, but the policy that they took pictures of in September when the allegation was made was paid up through the end of that year, which ended in February. So that didn't hold water either. These are just allegations. I, don't want, I, I, I want you to say more of what you might've heard because all of these are things that we can disprove. What happens, unfortunately, Black people give such blind allegiance to their alleged leaders that they can go on the radio and make these allegations because people give them a certain amount of deference. They say, why would this person we voted in office blatantly lie on something that can be disproven? That's why we're headed to federal court, because only under oath can we lay evidence down and have that refute everything that's been said under penalty of perjury, which is a felony. The, uh, another um, issue that was articulated from the representative of uh, Marquise Harris Dawson's office was, is that it was your personality um, and your difficulty that was one of the main issues. Can you I, respond to that? That, that might be, that might be, true depending on what you call difficulty. Um, I, I heard something on a radio show, heard Marquise Harris Dawson himself say on September 25th of 2019 on KJLH's front page that his office had tried numerous times to contact me in particular to no avail. Um, that's just an allegation. Um, no, this has not happened. Uh, and I, I have, would. Well, have you attempted to contact Marquise Harris Dawson? What has the communication been like between you and the office? Yes, I, I've tried to contact. Uh, I tried to have meetings with Marquise Harris Dawson ever since he was elected. Um, when he was running for office, was he, hmm? he elected was that? Uh, 2015, I believe. Okay. Uh, ever since he ran for this office, his campaign office was one block south of us uh, in the shopping center. Uh, I went down there, uh, did meet his wife, left my number, would like to speak to him 
um, about some things that we might be able to work on to be of assistance to the AFIBA Center. Um, and I've seen him numerous times and asked him if I might be able to get a meeting with him before any of this tension started. Uh, I was always referred to someone who was his scheduler or another person. Who, in other words, it never happened. Uh, sometimes I would never, I would, they would avoid even putting me on the calendar. And, and I think that's, that's unacceptable of an elected official. You've got somebody who's a, a constituent, a stakeholder. Um, what does it take you to, at some point, give this person audience? Total disrespect. So uh, just in answering the way your, your question was formulated, that, that I was difficult, I, I might be difficult. We are now engaged in a full-scale battle for our survival. We are supposed to be difficult. We're fighting for the survival of our community, and all indications are that these people who are in these positions uh, in city government are working to our detriment. So, yes, um, yeah, we're pushing for an issue here that is definitely against their agenda. There's, there's no compromise anyway. Um, when I got wind of this issue, I made some phone calls and one was to uh, a fairly prominent person in the community. Uh, her, uh, the name was uh, Jamerson, let's just say. And I asked her, D are you familiar with Destination Crenshaw Project? And she said, well, yes, I'm the executive director. <laughs> so I started to tell her, you know, the community is against this. There will be boycotts. There will be this and that. Because she, we had run into on another occasion and she saw what Tap and others could do. The first thing she said was, oh no, we, we can't have that. Our vendors will pull out. Not art, our vendors. This is Destination Crenshaw to replace the black vendors. That's its purpose, not art. Uh, art is just a, a fluff. Well, I, um, I think it's really interesting in me understanding what Destination Crenshaw was, I even got confused, but I discovered, and it was confirmed by uh, Marquise Harris Dawson's office, that there are two versions of Destination Crenshaw. There is the, there is the, the, the project that was proposed to the city council but there also is a nonprofit organization with the same name that's that collects right. money. That's right. It's a nonprofit right. organization. His chief of staff was the ch chief financial officer of Destination Crenshaw, which, of course, we sent that information to the FBI. It, it, this is a, an elected official's chief of staff on a nonprofit collecting tens of millions of dollars from the city, obviously illegal. So, but anyway, we met with Perkins and Will, the design team, uh, Dawson's staff members, and uh, the Destination Crenshaw uh, representative, CEO. We met, they said, uh, with Jabari, myself, and uh, another gentleman on our side, and they said, okay, based on what we've, we've heard, this is all on hold. Give us a week or give us oh, two weeks, I think it was, two weeks, and we'll, we'll get back to you on, on uh, the changes where, where we, we can start making. I got a call back in two weeks. And she said, they're not willing, because I had several conversations with her, they're not willing to to do anything. I said, nothing. They're not, no, they're not willing to make any changes. Mm -hmm. And I said, why? She said, because they own the land. They own the property. So basically, it doesn't matter how many people, how many times Jabari tried to meet with this guy. They don't care about that. They, they're arrogant. They want us, they just want it out. They feel mm -hmm. it's theirs. We feel it belongs to the people. And that's the way it's going to end up when this is all over. And let it's me add, be, go ahead, Brother Lynn. I'm sorry, I no, didn't mean. No, I just uh, I a, call it a premonition or a foreboding. 
the Fever Center will be back in the hands of Brother Jamari and the community, the community. And that's really what it is, in the hands of the community, instead of Marquise Dawson and his puppets, his gentrifying puppets. And and I just wanted to, to just jump right on what Lynn is saying. When people, our community is so uninspired and unempowered that when they hear something like this property is owned by the city, they don't, it doesn't connect with them that the city has purchased everything it has with the money of the people. You have something to say about everything that is owned by the city as a taxpayer, as somebody who is a stakeholder. And we have been so devalued that we've internalized that sense of devaluing, being devalued and thinking that we, have, we can make no demands whatsoever and we should roll over. So that is why we are still in this fight. This fight is not just for the Afiba Center. This is for the heart right. and the soul and survival of the African-American community. And ba well, based on, based on no. that, this is a, a very pivotal issue. Jabari just mentioned, this isn't just about the Afiba Center or even Crenshaw. When they get through with Crenshaw, guess where they're going? They're going to Vermont. They're going to Western. Mm -hmm. This is about gentrification 101. South Central Los Angeles has the highest concentration of single family residences, not in Los Angeles, not in California, not in the United States, but on the planet. Wow. The major source of wealth building for the average person is a, is a, is a, a home. So what does that tra translate to? Trillions, trillions of dollars in mortgages, in development, in, in construction. That's what the FIBA Center and the struggle for Crenshaw and the Crenshaw area and Nexus coming, Vermont and the rest of they want all of it. Vermont, they want, Athens they want Hill, all where out. I was raised. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, they, Dawson, it it Dawson, is all down Dawson. Crenshaw. It is all down Dawson. Crenshaw. When we say, when we say uh, Dorset Village, when we say Ralph's has moved out on Crenshaw and Slauson with no ingenuity offered by the councilmen to support progressive individuals coming in there and doing something for the community. When we talk about when we talk of Nipsey Russell's, Nipsey Hussle's place on Crenshaw and Slauson, when we talk about the Afiba Center, when we go north, further north to the Employment Development Department, the EDD building, we go still further north, we go to the Baldwin Crenshaw Mall. Mall. Which That's what I was going to mention. I was going to mention that. Yes, yes go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm listening. Yeah, a revolutionary community effort was put in place and dollars were raised to appropriately take charge of that facility. At a time where black, we say black lives matter, demonstrate they matter with a revolutionary project like that and get behind it. Marquise Harris Dawson has, this is also in his district, has not said one supportive peep about trying to see that the community own that facility. So right. it has, it is now on shaky ground whether or not we will even be able to take, uh, take it within our hands and within hold of our, ourselves the opportunity to take over that mall. So what Mr. Jumani, what Mr. Jumani is talking about is, is that recently, um, well, there was, there's been a bidding war that has been going on in the sale of Baldwin Hills Crenshaw Mall. A lot of people don't know that's actually the first mall that was built in the United States. Um, and it is, it has been a hub. It has been a cultural, a commercial and a cultural hub in the black community. I remember when I was an LA Sentinel reporter and the Pan-African Film Festival come, baby, that mall would be filled and packed. That's and, right. and, 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 and black people from around the country, not just the county, the country would come for almost a month to attend the Pan-African Film Festival, which was just one of the many things that happened at the mall. So there was this bidding war that went on. The highest bidder was an organ or a collective called uh, Downtown Crenshaw Rising, which comprised of, of black folk, local black folk who privately raised money, put in the highest bid, 
And it wasn't, they didn't even get the mall. It was sold to the developer. Um, I, his name escapes me. If you can help me out on that, that would be, that would be good. But the, the, what it is we're talking about, if you can take a map and you connect all the dots, you see that these are very intentional um, yeah. projects or takeovers, you know, that are going on um, in the area. Um, and Absolutely. the Afiba Center is the last thing standing. Even, I know I, I briefly mentioned it and a lot of people, no. I think, don't like to, excuse me, sir, yes? Correct uh, it, me, I'm it, ready. It, it's not the last thing standing. See, all is well, all is not well in paradise. I said that earlier. Mm -hmm. Dorset Village, it's not happening. A FIBA center, they've waited all this time because they've gotten so much H-E-L-L. -H the mm -hmm. uh, uh, EDD, he lost on that. The mall, it's it's not over. It's, it's, it's far not. from over. It's okay. far, okay. you only, you only lose when you quit. Oh yes. And sir. the war is the war is never over until all parties. The United States, the great powerful United States, just learned that again in Afghanistan. Afghanistan. They are learned it again in Iraq. They learned it again in Vietnam. The but Vietnam. they don't learn. They don't learn. A war is not over until all parties say it. It is. Thank so you. just a small correction. It's not. No, over. thank you. I, no, 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 no. I, I, I embrace it, and I, I, and I thank you for providing that wisdom and that um, insight. You're welcome. But I, what I was leading, what I was leading to is, I know we very, very briefly touched on Nipsey Hussle, but a lot of the people who are listening are people who supported him, are people who knew Crenshaw through him and through his music, and some people through his efforts. When I was doing the groundwork for the Afiba Center two years ago, the sentiment of the younger folk was that they felt that he was used, his That's name right. and his efforts were used in order to present this image of Black ownership and Black wealth and Black empowerment in the area. And in his untimely passing, um, that wasn't the case. And even more so, I want to bring this up because we, we did speak about this, is, is that the mural that is on Slauson and Crenshaw on the U.S. Bank that Brother Jumani uh, pointed out, but that mural that is on there, the part where Nipsey Hussle is on was painted at the Afiba Center. Yes. So, the, you know, so the, the, the entire mural that wraps around two sides that entire mural was painted at the Afiba Center. It was a year long project and a collaborative by some community artists and youth from the community um, spearheaded or, or led by the, 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 the premier artist, uh, uh, Brother Moses. Um, and it, is now, it was now placed, um, you know, hopefully in perpetuity on the U.S. Bank, mm -hmm. right on the corner of Slauson and Crenshaw. That whole, that entire mural, every bit of it was painted inside of the Afiba Center. And I and I want to add the irony is um, is is that while uh, Nipsey Hussle, um, it, it, it this is definitely documented, and even Destination Crenshaw on their IG page heavily promoted that Nipsey Hussle was a proponent of Destination Crenshaw. What we know is is that the marathon store and those properties in that area were heavily surveillanced um, by um, the LAPD and they were harassed by the LAPD and that people in the city office did not want to see them there. So it's very ironic that here on one end, he's promoting a project by a council member, but on the other end, some of the same entities in the, entities in the same office you know, are uh, perhaps doing some things in order to uh, the city attorney's uh, office. They, the they attorney harassed office. him so much. They um, they had to put a fence around it because they were claiming they were gang members and they were trying to get injunctions to wrestle that property from them. And Dawson, was, I'm sure, was sitting in right on that because it Nipsey Hustle again, Dorset Village. A FIBA center, EDD, all 
within a block. Mm -hmm. All of this stuff happening. It, it, it's all deliberate. Mm -hmm. They're still trying to trying to uh, rustle it from them. So I want to bring to your attention something, um, uh, Brother Jumani, that you sent. And it is a motion dated June 27, 2021. And the motion is uh, presented by uh, Council Member Harris Dawson. And the motion is to replace the AFIBA Center organization with Community Build Inc., a nonprofit organization, uh, into the building that AFIBA Center occupied. In the motion, the AFIBA Center is described, or the, the building in which the AFIBA Center has used for the past 20 years has been described as a vacant property. Um, what we know is, is that the motion was passed and where do we stand with that? Do you know? Yes, we um, had vehement community uh, uh, outrage um, that was voiced to the city council at every stage. And there were probably three different meetings where this motion uh, was open for public comment. And uh, outside of the very last meeting where uh, the triplets reared their head, and I mean the triplets of uh, 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 chicanery, skullduggery, and shenanigans uh, by the city council, uh, when those three came out again, um, they sort of sidestepped the ability for folk to speak directly to these motions and give it the full breadth that it deserved. So we, as, as, as Mr. Moses mentioned earlier, there is a pattern and a practice, which is uh, longstanding in city government that if any councilman brings forth a motion, they all vote on it, no matter how corrupt it is, no matter they how much yes information. On it. Yes, no matter how much, what did you say, good brother? They vote yes on it. Yes, they vote, excuse me, correction, point of clarity. They don't just vote on it, they vote yes to support whatever councilman that is because they know that at some point they're gonna bring something corrupt forward and they want blind allegiance paid to that. So that's where we are with this particular measure um, and motion that it has gotten the full weight and support of city council. So on the surface, it looks like this is what will be done. However, as brother uh, Moses, uh, uh, was explicit and implicit earlier, uh, all that is said, uh, no matter how forcefully, does not make it so. And we as a community will continue uh, to assert ourselves and use what measures we can to force a different change. Because after all, one thing we, a lot of people get out of, out of sync with, these people work for us. They're voted in by us, they can be taken out by us. And it's high time that we demonstrate and maybe flex the muscles to let them know that we are dissatisfied with the level of disrespect. Um, you can make a mistake. To make a mistake is human, but to disrespect someone is unforgivable. That's deliberate, that's intentional. And if you are someone who's taken an office and you have given your pledge and oath to uplift this community, we can't go for that. We can't go for disrespect. So that at this point, uh, speaking to your uh, uh, question on the motion itself, city council has voted at every stage, all three stages to approve this measure. Mm. Which was a foregone conclusion. I mean, there, it's, it's just the system that's in place. And that's why Dawson can go, he has the, the luxury offices I've talked about on Crenshaw it's just the, the beginning of it. It's just continually. He has $433,000 uh, in 2018 for a move to the Fame Building and the $10,000 a month lease. The biggest one, his original office at 8475 Crenshaw Boulevard. You wanna know the price tag on remodeling this place? This $8.3 million dollars oh you know why because that's right there in stone's throw of the, the stadium right it's the, it's they're coming they're coming yeah all right 8.3 million dollars to remodel this office and in the meantime 
he's he's got these other three offices, 541,433, 308, for 20,000 a month, 10,000 a month, 17,000 a month. Plus, there's his downtown city hall office. <laughs> what? Mm -hmm. There's money being exchanged in the construction of these things. And that's what the FBI is for. They're already investigating. So I so I have a I have a question. How many offices does a city council member ha should have? Oh, good question. All of them have the downtown office and one and one um, in uh, the community and one in right. right now. Right. He is. We're paying. We are paying for three plus plus his downtown office. And what, and what, the highest, if he were creating thousands of jobs, hey, but this is a guy who does nothing but go around uh, a destination Crenshaw gentrification project. He drives a Lexus, not a Lexus, a um, uh, Tesla, a luxury Tesla paid for by the city of Los Angeles. Mm. Uh, it, you know, it just goes on and on and on. This guy is pimping the black community, that's all. Uh, one quick question, Mr. Moses, since, you, since you're astute um, in his matters. Is there a connection of, uh, of this Marquise Harris Dawson case to the Build Baby Build Eric Garcetti um, um, building boom? Um, is there oh, any connection that oh you know of? My, my goodness, okay. Jose Huizar. And Garcetti, the mayor of Los Angeles. Yes, me. Jose yeah. Huizar was head of the Plum Committee, Planning and Land Use Committee. This is one of the reasons why anything he puts forth, all of these luxury offices will be voted yes on. So all the other city councilmen, when they have a, a building, a luxury building, whatever, it has to go through his committee. Oh, anyway, Jose Huizar was uh, indicted and will be on trial, starting trial is uh, in May. A millions of dollars in pay to play in the city of Los Angeles. He was the head of the Plum Committee, all planning and land use. Since his indictment, Dawson was, was uh, appointed to this position. So it goes hand in hand. All planning and land use must come out of the city council and into its own department. That's the only way we're gonna stop the corruption. And they can do what they are there for, to represent people instead of billionaire developers. So it goes uh, Garcetti's building and Dawson's uh, plum committee are lockstep. Thank you. So this, I know, is an ongoing conversation. We at Arc Republic will be following um, um, this case of the Afiba Center. I know next week, September, was it 13th? Excuse me. Is it 13th, um, Mr. Uh, Jumani, that you've got to respond? The 15th. 15th. OK. 15th. September 15th. OK. So so we will we will be expecting to hear what that is. We will definitely be following um, the AFIBA Center and what is going all things gentrification um, in Los Angeles. I always give the last, the last thoughts to my guests. Um, I would like to thank you uh, before you give your last thoughts. Um, what do you have to say? Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, Sister Kaya, for giving us the opportunity to voice our community concern and put it in front of the people. Because when you shine that spotlight on this type of corruption, only then will, can people see it and analyze it for themselves. And we appreciate you giving us this opportunity. <clears throat> Excuse me, the battle is not over. We have just begun. Do not despair. For if you do not give up, if you do not acquiesce, and don't bend your back, your enemy can't stand on you. So we're gonna stand firm, we're gonna stand strong, and we're gonna come out swinging. I think they understand 
that this was inappropriate, um, but I don't think they expected the opposition that they are now receiving. And the creator has put us in the proper place and space to make a stand for the people. And we intend to do just that till every brick is crushed. Thank you, Mr. Jumani. Mr. Moses? Um, as Brother King said, um, man can't ride your back unless it's bent. They had no idea what, and they still don't, because they don't have the mentality of what it, what it means to be conscious and for your people. They only understand the money. They had no idea that we would still be here. This is far from, far from over and we will prevail because we'll never quit. They don't want us out there picketing with their billion dollar project. It's, it, <laughs> we can't lose unless we stop. And that goes for anybody anywhere, not just Los Angeles. It's impossible for us to lose. Thank you for well, your I time. Think, oh, no, I, I, I thank you. And, and I hope that um, the, those triplets, what was it, shenanigans, skullduggery, and what was the other one? Chicanery. Chicanery. <laughs> meet, meet Shango's twins, Hello. justice and resistance. There you go. We will be following this. I thank you, uh, Mr. Jabari Jumani of the Afiba Center and community activist, Mr. Lynn Moses. May we move forward in progress. This is Blessings to you. Thank you. And Ark Republic as well. Let's embark on the Ark Republic to hear current news that's published. More than gossip and chatter, covering current affairs that matter. We talk issues with professional views, all keeping you in queue. We wanted a higher vibe for these days and times to free the voices and minds. Reporting the sign of the times so all can build. Let's shine. Yeah.